I, we thought this would be a great topic since people are getting food minded for the holidays. And this is basically over 200 years of tradition in how the White House serves meals. Uh, we go into issues of technology. We discuss actually some of the more political aspects uh, oh, yeah, you didn't think <laughs> it would be politicized, but everything gets politicized at some point. And, uh, and just the personalities of how things are done. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay, well, uh, that's a very, very early print of the original White House. This is from the north side. And if you're looking for the portico with the columns that they stand in front of on CNN and others, it's not there yet. Uh, it was in the design, but as usual, the government didn't have enough money. Uh, in fact, when John and Abigail Adams moved in, uh, they had to keep the fires going day and night to dry the plaster <laughs> on the walls. In fact, uh, much of what we know about this very early period, Abigail wrote to her daughter. And one of the things she said is that the principal stairs are not up and will not be this winter. And there's actually a difference in the type of dinners. They have a state dinner and an official dinner. And there is a reason because state dinners are formal dinners for America, uh, foreign heads of state. And that is paid for out of the State Department budget. I mean, the government pays for all of it, but it is a different budget. In fact, I found a great story about Mary Lincoln. She wanted to entertain a, a, a prince, a, a Russian prince, if I remember correctly. And she gave a, a budget for the dinner she planned to uh, the Secretary of the Interior because the White House is administered by the National Park Service, which reports to the uh, Secretary of the Interior. And he turned her down flat because he said that uh, William Seward, who was then the Secretary of State, had entertained the same prince a week before for half that amount. <laughs> so uh, anyway, official dinners are paid out of the White House budget and uh, uh, you know, state dinners are paid out of the State Department budget. It's just all moving money around. And uh, so in this case, this was the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Cameron. And when he came to the White House, it was not, it was an official dinner. He was no longer his secretary, the Prime Minister. And so they made these subtle differences in these dinners. Um, some of the changes are a state dinner, the men dress white tie and tails. Uh, in an official dinner, they dress in tuxedos, black tie. And uh, another thing they do, which I think is interesting, is that a state dinner has a 21-gun salute and uh, an official dinner has a 19-gun salute. And, and actually, even the menu is scaled back a bit. So it, it's really sort of interesting how they do stuff. Now, these are some really very early invitations. And the first one is from Adams is dated uh, March 1801, and uh, it's all handwritten. And the time for dinner is 4 p.m., which we would consider sort of like an English high tea. But there may have been a really good reason for that, because as I alluded to just a minute ago about the unfinished state of the White House, this also applied to the grounds. And I actually found a letter written to a guest by another guest advising him to arrive at the president's invitation in the daytime, lest he trip over some leftover tools or fall into a pit. <laughs> it, it took some years to gradually make the whole surroundings inside and out much more user-friendly. And this was later on by 40 years later, in the Polk administration, they were doing pre-printed forms. So that was a major thing. This way, nobody had to keep handwriting all these things. And uh, what happened was is that at the very top, somebody wrote in Mrs. Polk. 
So it wasn't just the president inviting, he added in his wife's name. And we'll hear more about her later. Now, these are rather more, much more current ones. At this time, they're pre-printed. They have a, a more presidential look about them. And this time, the president and first lady will invite the guest. <laughs> and these are some early innovative there. Uh, Jefferson is, had been minister to France and his slave, James Hemings, was trained in the French culinary tradition. He became an expert chef. And one of the innovations supposedly was introducing ice cream to the White House. And this is actually a recipe for that. And this is what a Senator said at a Jeffersonian dinner. He described the dessert as a curious contrast as if the ice had just been taken from the oven because it was actually encased in warm pastry. Shows how good James was. And this is another view of, of the White House. And, you know, I call it the French connection because through most of the 19th uh, and, or, and into the 20th centuries, there was this always strong influence because the uh, French style, French furniture, French food was considered the knee plus ultra. And of course, uh, Americans then had a vast inferiority complex uh, in re regard to, uh, you know, foreigners, especially Europeans. You know, we were thought we were uh, untutored backwoodsmen, you know, constantly scalping Indians and riding flat boats uh, down the rivers and all that stuff. And so we were always trying to prove no less in the White House, that we really did know about the finer things. But that could also lead to an issue too, and we'll get to that. Now, this was a really strange thing with James Hemings. Uh, I mean, Jefferson regarded him well enough to have a, a painting of him made in his toque, and yet he was still a slave. And he was the brother of Sally Hemings, and I'm sure you all heard about her. And the perplexing thing is that in France, they were free. They could have gone to any French court and petitioned for their freedom, and it would have been granted in revolutionary France. They voluntarily returned to the United States uh, to slavery. And, uh, you know, it's thought now they did that because they didn't want to be forever separated from their family and friends. So even though it wasn't ideal, they did it. And, uh, you know, he uh, supposedly did, he's attributed to have uh, introducing creme brulee, meringues, whipped cream, macaroni and cheese, ooh, mac and cheese. Uh, and it was really interesting because James was given what they called uh, grocery money in Philadelphia. So he actually shopped for everything he cooked in Philadelphia. And once again, in Pennsylvania, he was a free man. All he had to do was stay there. But again, he chose to stay in slavery. And it wasn't until 1801, when Jefferson became president, that he finally purchased his freedom. And, you know, very perplexingly, not too long after that, he actually committed suicide. And that's always been very mysterious. But his role is still very important in the history of the White House. Now, this is one of the strangest things that ever happened some years later. Uh, Washington was threatened by the British. Uh, now, Washington then had about maybe seven or 8,000 people. It was in the literally in the middle of nowhere and it had no strategic value whatsoever. But uh, the British attacked it because it was what we now call a proportional response. We burned down their provincial capital of York, Ontario, which is now uh, Toronto. And they felt they had to respond in kind. And uh, so Mrs. Madison hoped that her husband and his cabinet would be able to meet up at the White House before they had to leave. And she even actually wrote that she wished she had a cannon to put at every window of the house. 
And uh, she actually left a mere two hours before the British came, but uh, she left the whole thing there. And uh, what happened is, this is what one of the British wrote, said, everything was ready for the entertainment of a ceremonious party. The troops feasted on the food, drank all the wines and threw lit torches through the windows of the home that had so liberally entertained them. And this is probably the White House's most bizarre meal. <laughs> uh, President Jackson was awarded a 1400 pound cheese, <laughs> a wheel of cheese. Uh, and uh, the central New York dairy farmers were trying to show because uh, the Erie Canal had just been built a little bit before. And they said, we're uh, New York on the move, heading west. And that was a huge boon to New York City because one of the reasons why it's the great banking and trade center it is today was that it was the only Eastern seaboard city that had direct access to the Great Lakes. And that was, I mean, New Yorkers spent a lot of money to build that canal and they made a lot of money out of it. And so it was, it was just a disaster because in order to get rid of it, he invited the public to come in and you see them all cutting pieces of it. And it just got to be a seething mob of humanity. I mean, the people just smeared cheese all over the chairs and the draperies and the furniture. And this was 1837, and the whole room, rooms had been redecorated in 1829. So this was stuff was all brand new. And it was never easy getting Congress to refurnish the house. In fact, many of the early presidents bought their own furniture they used to put in some of the rooms and then took it away with them when they left. And, but Jackson left it to Martin Van Buren who had to petition Congress to refinish. <laughs> and they still have some pieces at the time. One of the things they bought was this huge a table, a gold table service, which is used for big fancy dinners. And uh, they bought it from the Russian ambassador at the time and they still have it. So, you know, it all works out in the end. <laughs> now this is where the political part comes in. Uh, if people who were not on the East Coast and had less contact with Europe really didn't like these French styles and French dress and I mean, French everything in the White House. And I mean, it was sort of this de rigueur tradition that when someone of the opposite party got elected to the White House from the hinterlands like Tennessee or something, they would have to make this ceremony uh, uh, old speech condemning the White House and there's one thing in the uh, in Van Buren's administration, somebody said, a guest asked, he was from like Kentucky, and he asked if he could take one of the dessert, silver dessert spoons, because he was going to show it at home to show how effete and how French and how expensive the White House was on the backs of the people. This was the people's house. I mean, people were much more conscious of these things in those days. Now, not so much. In fact, uh, in the Monroe administration, uh, a, a Washington Irving had a dinner there and he described it as it was served in the French fashion, but a little Americanized. <laughs> and so they probably, I would guess that they probably had American favorites, turkey, ham, oysters. Uh, and that seems to uh, be cropping up at various points. And this was sort of interesting, trying to buy food. Can you imagine the president actually going marketing? <laughs> but as somebody says, the worry of office and the importunities of office seekers drove him to depend entirely on his steward. So the stewards got to have a lot of power. And maybe that's one of the reasons why he died a month after his inauguration. Uh, he's our shortest term president ever. And this is where the food came from. They had markets in the center of town. This 
as you see, the, the DC center market, this is late 19th century, it got really big. It, it really provisioned the entire city. And they also had one out past the capital called the Eastern Market. And that's another place. And so basically pretty much everything was done, you know, bought right there. Very few, they, there were very few things in 19th century that were pre-prepared like we're used to now where you could ship them over long distances and, and send them. I mean, everything had to be, you know, on the scene and fairly fresh. And the, in a way, the center market was a big advance because before that, when you were, you had to go literally from shop to shop. You had to go from the butchers, you had to go to, you know, uh, the, the bread baker and all that stuff. It was very time consuming. Now, Sarah Polk was rather interesting because she actually introduced a, a bold new concept and she actually started to subcontract things that had been done for 40 years uh, in-house, like the daily baking, you know, rolls, bread rolls, stuff like that. That was done uh, for parties and everything. Somebody else, these are all ordered outside and bought to the White House instead of being made on the scene. And, uh, so like one provided ice cream, lady fingers, grape pyramids, I guess little pyramids made of grapes. <laughs> and uh, as he spelled it, ferment, fermented with an eye fruits <laughs> and, and sauces for ice cream. So uh, all this stuff all of a sudden started being in. And we know she was involved because she, the remaining receipts all have her signature on them, so it wasn't just a steward. She was definitely very involved. Okay, now this is interesting about the kitchen technology. They were originally built with actual fireplaces with swinging cranes to bring in cauldrons and long handled frying pans and things to stoke the fire with. And they did this for 50 years and uh, like here's something in uh, a typical thing in the Monroe administration. They had like a, one large copper soup kettle, one large preserving kettle, one large coffee broiler, two griddles, one toasting iron. I mean, I could go on and on from this inventory. But uh, one of the things is that in 1891, a man who later became the chief usher, Ike Hoover, and the chief usher's office is basically in charge of the overall mansion, keeping it clean, making sure everything's get repaired and they oversee staff and everything. And he actually became one. And this is what he said. He found the basement kitchen was blackened with dirt and grime and the floor covered with slimy bricks. And in his book, he said, the old open fireplaces once used for broiling the chickens and baking the hoe cakes for the early fathers of our country, the old cranes and spits still in place. <laughs> but change was coming. <laughs> yeah, so President Fillmore, he actually bought in and White House lore tells us that the cooks were so baffled about how to manage this that he actually took a walk over to uh, the US patent office and to get instructions so he could tell them how it worked. <laughs> and uh, they had a lot of, each administration as we got older and more refined, we got grander and grander uh, things going. And it says here that uh, one of the biggest events in before the civil war in the Buchanan administration, we entertained Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales. It was the first royal visit to the United States. And uh, he later became Edward VII. And uh, this is what they served. They had two extravagant affairs and 5,000 people were served during the two events, which included 400 gallons of oysters, 75 hams, 1,200 quarts of ice cream, among other delicacies. And they had very, very, a lot of courses in those days. Now, when Mary Lincoln came, 
she was probably one of the most expert at cooking and kitchen management. And I thought that was very funny. It really was literally true. You know, they knew and she knew and they knew that she knew. <laughs> I, I think that's, and uh, her lasting contribution was that she moved the kitchen, which were always in the basement from one side of the house to the other. And um, we don't know why, but we believe that the light was most probably better in one place than another. And uh, it was really interesting in that administration, like uh, this shows you a typical thing from the post-war era. So even the dinners, everything was getting grander. Uh, the grants supposedly had 29 courses. And I guess a lot of them were like, you know, uh, ices and everything to sort of between fish and meat and vegetable and, you know, it was a lot of stuff. No wonder why they had to have a ball after. And this is the very first state dinner just before Christmas, 1874. King Kalakua of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And he was there trying to get a, a trade deal. This was long before we annexed them. In fact, actually, uh, Freddie and I were in Hawaii last year and they have uh, this museum called the Bishop Museum, which you ever get to Honolulu, you must see this place. And uh, they really explained that the Hawaiian royal family really did some very perplexing things. And part of it was by genetics because they believed that uh, brothers and sisters perpetuated the royal line. And the bill was coming due by the 19th century. Um, in fact, uh, Kala Kwa, he actually gave the United States Pearl Harbor which actually provided justification to annex the islands in 1893. So it, it got very complex, but this is actually the East Room and you notice the decor. This is style is known as steamboat Gothic because it looked like the grand salons of Mississippi River steamboats of the period. And it was there quite a few years. And these are some presidential personal tags. Uh, William Crook had served in the White House, not only for Lincoln, but he served through five administrations. And he wrote about Lincoln that, that the president preferred large farm style breakfast and he especially was beloved of bacon. And uh, James Garfield, by the 1880s, he must have loved peanut butter so much because he actually made this announcement that man cannot live by bread alone. He must have peanut butter. <laughs> and this is the luncheon menu for the only wedding ever held in the White House. Uh, Frances Folsom married the president and uh, she is the only uh, first lady ever to be married in the White House, the only first lady ever to give birth in the White House, and the only one so far to have served as first lady two terms, but not consecutively. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in 2024, President Trump does get back into office. Melania will match that. <laughs> But I like some of the stuff they had. They had soft shell crabs. Uh, they had snipes on toast, lettuce with tomato salads, fancy ice cream, cakes, fruits. You know, it was a big deal. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and here's the evolving kitchen. This is the only known picture of the kitchen in the 19th century. And this is the Harrison administration. As you can see, the curved arches of the basement holding up the entire house. Uh, and actually, they actually had more doing that. In fact, in the Truman renovation in the 1940s and early 50s, they found most of the house was resting on six foot brick pillars standing directly on dirt. And I'm no engineer, but even that didn't sound good. <laughs> And so a lot of things had to be done. In fact, uh, one of the things I'm planning to do is 
uh, doing a whole program on the many different structural and decorating changes made in the house over the years. So I'm still tossing that around. So just see what will happen next. And this woman is believed to be Dolly Jackson. And she most probably was because uh, she had been born into slavery. And even though they actually had a French chef, uh, Mrs. Harrison wrote to some relatives in Kentucky and asked if they could recommend and send a cook because apparently the president and the family, because they had several young children uh, still, they wanted something a little more down home and her specialty were her native Kentucky recipes. And she was there quite a few years, about 20 years. And this is the first 20th century kitchen because when Theodore Roosevelt came in, he hired the firm of McKim, Mead and White to make great designs, redesign the whole White House. And really they swept away this whole Victorian look uh, I mean, things uh, they did like that steamboat palace with the big heavy chandeliers and everything, they, that was all removed. Much of how the first floor public rooms look, which was sort of like a more early federal style look uh, was attributed to them. And they also did the kitchen, tried to make it more modern and more functional, but this was still quite, uh an issue it, it just keeps going on and on and this is the fdr kitchen and it, it's funny she actually uh eleanor roosevelt hired a housekeeper uh and uh her name was henrietta nesbitt and she described that there's this ceremonial visit that an outgoing first lady conducts a private tour of the mansion to the incoming first lady and, and, and lets her to meet department heads and sort of orients her. And uh, Lou Hoover uh, took her, Mrs. Rojo, right to the doorway of the kitchen and told her she would have to wait there for her housekeeper because she had never entered the kitchens once in the four years she was there. <laughs> and. Uh, so Mrs. Roosevelt took a hand and uh, according to Mrs. Nesbitt, she said that uh, uh, they had these decrepit old wooden cabinets. They had, the place was full of ants and as she described monster cockroaches and uh, a, lot of, a lot of work had to be done. And Eleanor got uh, an appropriation to vastly modernize and expand the kitchen. And uh, Mrs. Nesmith, though, says she still had odds with staff doing things that they had always done them, even though they didn't have to. I think one of the cases I ran across was that instead of using the new electric dishwashers, they were still washing dishes by hand. So she, there was a lot of issues involved. And on the left, that's Mrs. Nesbitt. And she loomed very large in the mid 20th century because she was there 12 years almost. And, uh, but you know, she became legendary, but not really in a very, very good way. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. And uh, what happened is, is that she supposedly ran this house with an iron hand and uh, she was known for her very dispiriting meals. And uh, here's <laughs> a good picture of it. it. looks like Eleanor's trying to get the FDR to have <laughs> something to eat and he hated it. I mean, she had things like salt beef and prunes. She actually had uh, what they called a 10 cent luncheon. And uh, let's see. This is what it was. Uh, they actually tracked it down for a magazine, Taste of Home. And she says she paired deviled eggs with tomato sauce, mashed potatoes, wheat bread, and coffee. And it was called the seven and a half cent menus. And uh, this is what Ernest Hemingway said about his dinner. Said we had rainwater soup followed by rubber squab, a nice wilted salad, and a cake some admirer had sent in. 
an enthusiastic but unskilled admirer. And I mean, it, 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 Mrs. Nesbitt was a legend, but the first lady was very passive aggressive about her. She was her greatest champion. And uh, I mean, the president couldn't stand her meals. He actually had what they called a diet kitchen installed on the second floor so that his uh, assistant, Missy Lahan, could make some simple things for him so he could avoid being served by Mrs. Nesbitt. And uh, it, she basically never met uh, a canned food on sale she didn't like. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was a terrible time to be eating in the White House, believe me. And uh, and another thing about Mrs. Roosevelt, she traveled so frequently, whereas the president was there every day. So she ate many, much less meals <laughs> than the president had to. And staff who were there at the time said she didn't seem to really be very conscious of what she ate. She couldn't cook. In fact, her only cooking achievement is that she would invite honored guests of hers. And the White House was basically like a hotel in those years, people always coming in and out. And uh, she would scramble eggs in a chafing dish. And the staff, because of the star power of the people she invited, called them scrambled eggs with brains. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Nesbitt's time had come. Uh, she, she stayed on for the Trumans and uh, she completely blew them off on their menu requests. Uh, the president didn't want Brussels sprouts. He still got them. And finally, this is really true, the last straw or stick. And this is what happened. Uh, Mrs. Truman, was going to a luncheon uh, with senatorial wives and everyone was supposed to contribute something because the war was still on. And she said she would bring a pound of butter and uh, Mrs. Nesbitt turned her down. She said it would ruin their ration for the week. And uh, she really kept a close eye, you know, every week she went down to the center market to the Office of Price Administration with the, her list to try and get the stamps <laughs> to get what they needed. It was really, thing. and so Mrs. Truman went to Mr. Krim, who was the chief usher at the time, and Mr. West, his assistant was there and he wrote about it. And she said that, uh, she just told me I can't have a stick of butter. Can she do that? And uh, Mr. Crib exploded, says, of course she can. This is entirely out of order. And says, well, then I think we need a new housekeeper. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> you know, she was pensioned off. She, a few years later, she wrote her book. And, uh, you know, I think she did okay. But still, I mean, it shows you how things can be totally upset by the merest little things. But I mean, basically they have these rules in the White House, which I'm sure is still true. Like one of the things I found is that never tell a first lady how her predecessor, any of her predecessors did anything unless she asks. <laughs> now, when Mamie got in, she took a very strong hand in provisioning the White House. This is a picture with her with one in house when going over the inventory. And uh, she actually would call up uh, supermarkets. She would look at the ads in the paper and, uh, and she would look for sales and she'd call them directly and answer the manager. Uh, she said that, said, don't, uh, you know, always go to the top. Don't bother with some clerk. <laughs> and, uh, and she would try and get a bargain rate for, for the White House. And they would actually go out in a White House car and pick this stuff up and bring it back. Uh, and according to her granddaughter, who was her biographer, she said she did not know how to cook whatsoever, uh, because uh, according to her biographer, she said that she, someone told her as a young woman that says that if you don't know how to cook, no one will ask you to do it. And she didn't. However, uh, she did want to keep tight control over the menus. and. Uh, 
her husband was having his oldest male friends for what he called a stag luncheon. And he actually made up a menu and submitted it to the chief usher. And when they were going over the menu for that day, she came to the subject of the luncheon. And uh, Mrs. Eisenhower would actually dictate these from bed. She'd have on her bed jacket and Mr. West would go in and take her notes, whatever she wanted done that day. And what happened was is that he told her, said, well, the president already approved this menu. And she said, from now on, all menus must be approved by me and no one else. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> now, it's funny, in contrast, her husband was an enthusiastic cook. He was always trying to cook something, especially for his friends. So it's really sort of interesting. I guess it was sort of a rest for him. And now the Kennedys, they were a whole different, I mean, uh, uh, the Eisenhowers, they had young grandchildren and everything. There was a lot of hot dogs and stuff like that. And uh, the, the Kennedys had this level of sophistication that was far and above the Eisenhowers in many ways, because I mean, their backgrounds, uh, uh, Jackie had been attended school at the Sorbonne and uh, JFK, I mean, his father was uh, the ambassador to the court of St. James. So he had access to some of the best restaurants in Paris and London. So he was no slouch either. And they introduced, uh, they actually got a new White House chef who was not a citizen. Uh, they hired him as, as his assistant. They, the president even inquired of the State Department how the passport was coming along <laughs> so that he could get into the White House. And uh, Rene Verdon, who was there like 30 years, he totally, I mean, uh, changed everything. But uh, let's see. Yeah, here's some, they had one dinner had Sol Veronique and Strawberries Romanoff. And uh, uh, I mean, the magazines and newspapers were absolutely wild with all things Kennedy. And also The Art of French Cooking by Julia Childs had come out. I mean, it just sort of fed the flames. <laughs> Everybody it, it had to do this. And this is a cool picture. I mean, there's always been a lot of <laughs> curiosity. And this is President Ford showing how he made uh, English toasted English muffins for the press. <laughs> and the modern kitchen, they can generally in the state dining room manage up to 140 guests comfortably, but they can actually do more if they have to. But I mean, they regularly update the kitchen keep it going and uh, uh, they uh, often do larger dinners in the east room which is the largest room in the house i mean it's uh, occupies the entire one entire side from front to back and uh, it actually has three doors you can actually enter from the red room the blue room and the green room uh, so it's it's pretty big uh, room so they can get one way or another I think i think a white house dinner set uh, is like 1200 pieces and that's an interesting story in itself because they use uh if it gets to below 1500 pieces they save uh pieces for history in their collection and the rest are destroyed they're shattered turned into powder and buried in a military installation in Maryland. And, and actually, uh, you still can't, you know, all these China companies, they cannot make a copy of White House China. They can make a derivative that's sort of somewhat based on it, but they really can't do the, the main thing. And see the contrast in the state dining rooms? <laughs> The old steamboat palace. Actually, uh, you see the chandelier here, the big one? That actually still exists. They, a thrifty government decided instead of throwing them out, they gave them to the Capitol building and they're there today. <laughs> but you see what a difference. And of course, one of the big differences was the tables because 
you can seat more people at a round table instead of the big long tables that they used to use. And even the grounds are pressed into service. This was uh, the congressional barbecue for Congress people and their spouses and their children. And of course they host the Easter egg rolls and everything, a lot of stuff is done on the grounds. And sometimes they order out, this is this, this very special case. Um, there was a government shutdown three years ago. If you, if you remember, Congress couldn't agree on how to fund the executive department, which is the White House. And uh, uh, President Trump uh, paid for all this McDonald's food out of his own pocket because the White House staff had been furloughed, the kitchen staff. And uh, is for the Clemson University football team. <laughs> and these were actually, according to him, his favorite foods. But even he had to uh, bend to uh, international ways of doing things. And this is the dinner they have for President Macron of France and uh, France. And this is what they had. Uh, they had a roast rack of lamb with Bert Cipollini soubise, a salad of young variegated lettuces and some creme fraiche ice cream for dessert. So even though it wasn't his favorite type of meal, he, he still went with it because he needed to. <laughs> now this is really a bizarre story. <laughs> it's my favorite one. Uh, Bill Clinton actually did verbal interviews about his life in the White House. And this is how uh, President Boris Yeltsin of the Russian Federation tried to get himself a takeout pizza. He was very, very jet lagged and had eased himself by drinking probably too much vodka. And he was staying with his entourage in uh, Blair House, which is right across the street from the White House. And he somehow managed to elude his security detail. Uh, and he was found by our Secret Service on West Executive Avenue in his underwear trying to hail a cab. <laughs> so they, 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 they got him back into the house and got him settled. And so the interviewer asked the president, well, you know, what did you do then? He said, we ordered him pizza. <laughs> And here's once again, who pays for the White House uh, food? It, it's this very strange interplay between one government department and another. And uh, they always try to make it work and they've, they've largely made it work. What's really interesting is that for congressional budgeting things, the White House doesn't ask for what they call an entertainment budget. Things like dinners and everything are actually funded out of the president's million dollar a year travel budget. So when he's not traveling, <laughs> they use it to fund things. And of course, if a president first lady invites personal friends uh, for dinner who happen to be visiting Washington and everything, they pay for it directly out of their own pockets. And that's the real, real importance of the chief usher because if there's any question about what the government pays for, what you pay for, they are the ones who, who can explain how it's supposed to be done. And uh, remember uh, the first President Bush, you know, running around Kennebunkport in his motorboat? Well, the Secret Service detail was paid for by the US of A, all of us. However, the gas and the docking fees, he paid for himself. <laughs> and here's a White House dinner tradition. It was, uh, as we know, President Trump and the press did not get along well. And so he refused to attend the White House correspondence dinner. And so uh, President and uh, Biden and Mrs. Biden actually attended for the first time in four years. And it's not held in the White House and the president doesn't host it. This is done by the association. And as part of the entertainment, the president is roasted, <laughs> but you know, in a respectful but funny way. And that's the end.
I hope you enjoyed that. It's going over a little over 200 years of food history, and I hope it inspires you for Thanksgiving. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me.